Hello, Maverick fans. Welcome to another edition of the Mav Puck Cast. I am Jason. And I am John, and it's great to be back for what oh, should be so for what good sh- to be back. For what should be a hockey season right now. We should be discussing UNO's home series with Alaska that just concluded on October 9th and 10th. But alas, we're not doing that. Instead, we're doing the first episode of season three, which might be our shortest season ever. Well, and let let me recap what has happened during the two seasons of this podcast. The first season, (laughs) UNO had one of their worst records. In fact, their worst record since the 03-04 season. The second season of this podcast, the season is ended abruptly because of a global pandemic, the likes of which we've never seen in our lifetime, meaning there was no postseason hockey. We didn't get to see how UNO did out at Denver University in the first round of the NCHC playoffs. So who knows what's going to happen this season? Yeah, apparently we're to blame, I guess. I guess so. so. I don't know. The, the Mav Puck board can start. <laughs> laying it at the altar of our feet and we can uh, see if we can get rid of this bad mojo and have a good season, even if it's a shortened season. So, Oh, yeah, you're exactly right. So plans here uh, for those who, who maybe haven't been following news and stuff, John, just to kind of put us at a current state of UNO hockey. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, we did not go to Alaska. We do not have any. We do not have a schedule. At this point in time, the 2020-2021 season is a hope and a prayer, as we have no expectation of when or where the team will be playing. But we do have players, right? And for those for those who don't know, the NCHC, which is our conference, has said that they are looking at starting the season after November twentieth. If and when that happens, we just don't know. But we have had some interesting, interesting uh, news this week, as uh, Jason mentions, with the uh, twenty twenty NHL draft. So I think we're going to start, we'll talk today a little bit about the draft, some of the incoming players, take a look at what um, what they'll look like with the team, and then you can join us next week and we will talk about the returning players and do, usually every season we've kind of done this, uh, who picks who, and I mean, we've gone as far as national title expectations that I seem to always get one year off on, so... It's going to we'll be re- talk about who's who's good and and who expects to be bad and, and what we expect out of the Mavericks this year. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to pick a national champion this year. I don't know if we pick a national champion or we pick whether or not we think they're going to have a, a national championship game this upcoming season. Do we it's just all- carry over from last season and say whoever you picked last year is your pick this year? Yeah, who'd you pick last year? Was last year your Wisconsin? year was that who you picked last year it was okay which you know that means wisconsin's gonna do pretty good this year because i picked bc the year before and they were one of the best teams in, well i've picked in duluth the country, so. i've picked minnesota duluth each season of this podcast so uh <laughs> maybe i continue that since they didn't get a chance to play for it last year yeah everyone listening is going boring that's right all right so nhl draft There was really nothing to talk about with this team in the NHL draft. We do not have any new draftees. Uh, The closest you can come to calling it a new draftee is our transfer from North Dakota, as he is new to us. It's kind of like owning a new car, right? Yeah, he's he's new. Yeah. If if you didn't own it before, it's new to you. It's new. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Johnny Tyconic. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I don't know. We we have a we have a long standing tradition on this podcast of butchering player names. So it, <laughs> if we are, it wouldn't be the first time. So we apologize, Johnny, if that happened. But he is a transfer from North Dakota, coming to UNO, and North Dakota had quite a few top draftees in the NHL draft this week. That's not uncommon for North Dakota. They usually get a lot of. 
high-end, next-level talent. Yeah, and three of those players are coming in this season, and the one you hear a lot about is defenseman Jake Sanderson. Um, yeah. He was drafted by Ottawa and uh, played for the U.S. National Training Development Program, and so, as you know, they get a lot of those guys on that team, and, and I'd imagine he'll be very good. Yeah, North Dakota should continue to be a force to reckon with. Yeah, the fifth pick in the first round. And so, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I look at that. The uh, you know NCHC had the draft picks. And you see North Dakota, you see Duluth, and you see Denver with multiple freshmen coming in this year who are NHL draftees. And we haven't had a lot of NHL draftees in the last few seasons. And we've talked a, a quite a bit about recruiting on this podcast and we've talked about how toward the you know end of the Dean Blaze era uh, it it felt to a lot of fans like recruit our recruiting fortunes had dropped off a little bit so um, as you said currently we have three NHL draftees on the roster we have the aforementioned Johnny Tyconic your favorite player Tyler Weiss and a fan favorite last season and certain to be a fan favorite this season, sophomore goaltender Isaiah Seville. So I think the thing to realize for, cause I think a lot of, um, a lot of people that are fans of NHL and NCAA, I found how ha- kind of get in this trap of thinking that, you know, the teams with the most draft picks are therefore the best teams. And, I, I would argue in a lot of cases that that's, not always the way you know they're usually competitive but it, a lot of those draft picks it has a lot to do with relationship between the scouts and the previous team and the coach at the NCAA level opportunities abroad and, and what students you know who are looking for opportunities have available to them um, and the connections between the coaches in, in the NHL and so you know, when we had Dean Blaze, we had that pedigree. You know, there was a lot of kids that would be looking at being mid to high level NHL talent that would take a look at a Dean Blaze clo- coached team and say, "That's where I want to go." And with Gabnet, as much as we love him, you know, we don't have that that pedigree, that name recognition. Um, but he's focused on building a program, um, setting expectations. He talks a lot about that at the. Uh, at the season ticket holder events and media events and things, he talks about doing things the right way and, you know, the, the team aspect and yeah, you know, exactly. The, yeah. The team first mentality for sure. And it's, you know, it's that old adage that he's looking for the, you know, the right guys, not necessarily the best guys. Right. I mean, just because they're a first round pick doesn't mean they're going to perform well in your program. And, I fully believe that if he sticks it out and then UNO sticks with him, you know, over time, he will get there. You know, the program will win. The the players will come. That recognition of, you know, these are the types of kids that can make, a, you know, a step to the next level uh, come out of UNO hockey. That it, It's just a great future to have. You just have to realize it takes, you know, a decade to kind of build that expectation in your program uh, and it takes the right guys now you know you can't do that by drafting hot shot kids who don't give up for the team um, you know drafting the wrong players to put into the wrong positions um, you know it, it really takes a, an all-in effort from everyone over a long course of time well and when you're in a situation like UNO has been in the last couple seasons you know one of the things that you're looking at is stability and you look at, again, we'll go back to your favorite player, Tyler Weiss, potentially future Colorado Avalanche player. Um, you look at a guy, I mean, he's had his struggles. You know, it. he did not come flying out of the gate, you know, and was a, a big impact player the way that somebody like Taylor Ward was on this roster. And so sometimes it's those, it's the lunch pail guys that really get the job done for you. And when, when you're in the position that UNO has been, where you've been struggling, you've been at the bottom of the conference, you need some of those guys who are going to have the work ethic to play game in and game out and do what the coaches want. Because like you said, sometimes you can get guys who, you know, are prima donnas, have an attitude problem, and they can just cause problems in practice, in the locker room. They can, they can just, 
uh, destroy team chemistry. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, obviously, you know, you'd love to have a roster full of, and, you know, top NHL draft picks like a, like a North Dakota or a Michigan or some of these other programs uh, that we, that we've talked about over the, you know, years and years on Mav Puck that have, you know, loads of tradition. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the coaches just have to find, uh, find players and put together a roster that's going to work. You know, they've got to make it work. There's plenty of, of examples of that kind of thinking. I mean, even at the, even at the higher end levels, I mean, you look at Toronto, you look at, uh, Edmonton. Edmonton is a classic example of, for a long time, has had, you know, first, second, third overall picks, and they've drafted great players, and they haven't made playoffs. They get ousted in the first round. You know, they get walloped in a game in the playoffs, and you know, it's just it seems like a lot of at least a lot of the Canadian media stuff that I read. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are like just like, what's going on with Edmonton? Uh, <laughs> that they just can't. You know, they have all this opportunity, they can't. You know, put it together, and you know, that's something that I think a lot of the established coaches in the NHL will tell you is that, you know, being a number one overall draft pick does not necessarily guarantee success. And the first round of the draft are littered with players who never see a puck in an NHL game ever, you know, that are perennial AHL guys and never make it up. And so it really is even at the, at the high end level about building a program and, and building a set of expectations and playing, you know, what you consider your hockey to be. And, you know, I think that that trickles down. I think college is the same way. There's some, some differences between NHL, you know, obviously differences between NHL and NCAA, but there's that, that same aspect of, your team needs to have a common goal and a common method of play and the right puzzle pieces, you know? Right. Uh, we've talked about, um, well, Luke Nogard, I think, is, is a recent example of a player who performed better in certain situations than he performed in other situations. And, you know, it's not a knock on his talent or anything as a, as a good player or a bad player or anything like that. It's that... You know, certain guys excel at certain things. You know, they have strengths, right. they have weaknesses. They have places where they're going to be uh, successful and places that they're not going to be successful. So you look at, you know, Isaiah Seville and and some goaltenders are, you know, better to be leaned on day in, day out and get the minutes and they perform better when they get the minutes. And other guys, you know, They need that break. You know, you lean on them for a series here and give them a night off and then lean on them for a series and give them a night off. And, you know, that rotation and stuff has to be figured out. It's the same thing with the forwards. Put them in a position. Um, You know, most players will go into... I I remember listening to the draft and they were doing their interviews with uh, some of the first-round kids. Well, of course, you know, due to COVID, it was these Zoom interviews... uh, back and forth these video interviews uh from you know their home or some small venue where friends and family were gathered and you know, it was interesting talking to them and, and almost always one of the one of the talking heads would say what do you consider the strength of your game to be or what are you the best at those types of things and and it, you really look at that saying you know this kind of player considers themselves to be a puck moving defenseman or a stay-at-home defenseman or you know I, I pride my creativity. You know, that's a guy that you got to put on a line with, with some speed and some talent because uh, they need they need other guys to work off of, right? Right. And then there's some guys that are just pure goal scorers. You know, they're their classic example of Lafreniere this year. Like, just goal score. That's what he does. Scores goals. That's his job. Just put him in a position. Let him do that. Well, and when you Sadly, talk- that's what UNO needs. We yeah, need that guy. I know. But- <laughs> Well, and when you talk about players meshing well with a roster, I mean, I think the the, the prime example in recent years for uh, UNO hockey is Jake Ginsel when he goes and he plays with uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. He was fortunate to be surrounded by some really good players on that roster that elevated his game and made his game better. But yeah, it's you know what what we talk about, and this is obviously here in Nebraska. This is a state that is uh, you know football obsessed and. Hockey is very different than football in the fact that there are a lot of opportunities um, 
for professional um, hockey players um, when we talk minor league, the various minor league hockey and the European leagues uh, in the NFL, you don't really have that. In the United States, there are very few pro opportunities for uh, football players. So obviously the players that they're getting in the draft, relatively speaking, are the cream of the crop and um, and tend to perform pretty well. You know, Obviously each year, much like hockey and basketball and everything else, there are players that turn out to be complete busts. So, um, so it's not a prerequisite for UNO to have, you know, a roster full of draft picks as they may have, you know, five or six years ago in order to be successful. I think the other thing for, particularly for UNO fans, because of where we look, you know, if you look at, I mean, I would say, the two draft picks only because, you know, the third is a transfer. So he wasn't initially coming here. So if you look at Isaiah Seville and Tyler Weiss, I think, you know, a lot of people look at him going, those are, those are low round guys, right? They're fourth rounders. Right. You know, I think a lot of people tend to forget that some of those stars even some of the best players in the NHL on your team are undrafted or I saw a stat like in the NHL this past season, 34% of the players that played NHL games were undrafted draft picks, uh, undrafted signees. So they, they weren't drafted in one of the drafts and and they were picked up at some point, you know, along the ways and, and work their ways up. And, and some of these kids may be looking at that saying, the way that I work myself into an NHL position is coming through UNO. And that's what we oh, want to absolutely. support. We want to support that idea, right? And yeah, Jake I, Gensel's a, your example. Jake Gensel's a perfect yep. example of that. Wasn't he like a, I think he was a fourth round pick, if I remember right? Yeah, I can't recall correctly, but he wasn't one of the high, high round picks. He was. I know he wasn't a first or second rounder. So at best he was third, but I'm, I would have guessed fourth round. Yeah, and as you mentioned with those undrafted guys, one of my favorite players, uh, former Mav Jeff Hogan. I mean, that was a guy who was not drafted. And here's a guy who started playing professional hockey after he left UNO in 2001, and he played until 2017. He played at the NHL level. He played in the AHL. I mean, he played a lot of professional hockey and had a very, very successful career. And again, he was one of those guys who, you know, uh, he, he wore his emotions, uh, on his sleeve. Uh, he was a, he was a heart player. He was a gutty player. Um, and ultimately he, you know, he is the effort matched, uh, the talent there and he had a very successful career. So again, time and time again, we'll watch guys who've come through this program who are NHL draft picks who they'll, they'll go and they'll. They might play in the AHL. They might end up in the ECHL, and then you never really hear from them again. So, and then keep in mind that for those that don't follow NHL news and and maybe aren't you know maybe maybe don't know or aren't actually thinking about how close this is to the we are to the horizon on this, but we've got seven additional draft picks in the next draft with Seattle coming into the NHL. So you've got a number of contracts that they have available to go out and sign, you know, kids like some of our seniors and things, maybe even juniors that that are looking to get out maybe a year earlier or something like that's an opportunity for those kids to make uh, make an impression this year. And, you know, I don't know that anyone on the roster isn't thinking how great it would be to play in the NHL. And so. You know, I think a lot of them look at that saying, you know, this is a year for me maybe to showcase my talent and find a position at the the next level, you know, be it with a new team or there's going to be a lot of upflux. There's going to be a lot of, you know, moving of players from here to there, especially at an AHL, ECHL level. So, you know, that that system progression for kids, I think, is going to, you know, be interesting and it'll be interesting to see how it affects teams like North Dakota. You know, teams with a lot of draft picks, do you have a lot of early exits because, you know, the NHL teams need them at an AHL or ECHL. And so it's just, you know, the appeal of the money, get out of college now and go play some hockey. That, I think, is more of a risk for a team like North Dakota or Denver or Duluth 
Boston, Boston College, those perennial names that have a lot of those draft picks, those are the teams that you would expect to see those kids jettison early. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I guess to sum up on this, uh, this little same, <laughs> Jason and I are saying it, uh, it would be nice to have had some, uh, picks in the draft this year to talk about, but it's not a prerequisite for success. And, uh, and we're hoping the team has success in whatever way, shape, or form the uh, season ends up happening. So, um, but I will say some of those guys I know that are th- those are going to be names that we hear in the NCHC um, over the next few years, and uh, and of course the success that North Dakota, Duluth, and Denver have had mean that they're going to get some of the talented players. So hopefully, uh, hopefully the coaches can continue the evolution of the UNO Maverick hockey team and get us uh, some of those draft picks uh, some of those draft picks down the road and I, and I think they will. We've got a lot of young recruits in the pipeline and uh, some of them may end up being draft picks in the next couple of years. We certainly we've had players play in the NHL pro- prospects game so um, you know we've got some talented players on the roster so so uh, that's always exciting but uh, so I'm next step is to, to talk about the kids coming in. Yes. Where I think, we, let's start with the non-freshman entry. Just, it seems like an easy place to go. And we've kind of already talked about Johnny there coming in. He comes in as a junior. Uh, I'm hoping that he comes in. I'm still kind of confused because he's on, everything I've seen from Omaha has said that he's on the team. But it still weirds me out that NCAA does not have him on the 2021 roster but has him on the 22 23 roster so i don't understand what's there but i assume that he is coming he's here now i assume (laughs) well yes that's that's what that's what uno has i don't know i i do think i it is would be interesting to know if some of these uh entities that talk about uh college hockey recruits have just kind of been in sort of a stunned hibernation the last six months because of uh, everything that's happened with COVID. I don't know, but yeah, he is, he is uh, definitely listed on the roster for this season. So uh, we're, we're going to go with the idea. We could really use a good solid blue liner um, on this team this year. So I'm excited. You know, we've had success in recent years with players who've come through the transfer portal. So uh, I hope we do this year and it's uh you know, I think you look at a guy like Kevin Conley who came from DU, and and uh, I'm I'm yeah I'm excited to get these guys. I, I think he'll be a good solid player. Um, I'm excited to see him this season. He played yeah, his junior think... ho- yeah, he played his junior hockey for Pennington, which is a which is a club that we've in the BCHL, which is a club that we've gotten a number of good players from the last few years. Um, so, including Taylor Ward. So. I'm excited to see him on the roster this season. I like I said, we needed another defenseman and um, another good, solid defenseman. And I think this is a guy who is looks like a pro prospect, pro size, pro skill type defenseman. So I just hope we're he pronouncing the, his name. He right. has the look and the pedigree of what I would expect uh, someone to be successful at. You know, at defense, I think you build from the back out. So it certainly helps having him in there. And I mean, we'll see it's sometimes I think that's where we need help. Sometimes I really wonder if, you know, what we, the problems that we see on the back end are actually a result of what we see up front. And the numbers game on on defense for UNO is one that I I feel our balance is off a little bit. So he was kind of an interesting transfer in my book, but I fully expect him to to be a starter top, you know, if not the top pairing, top two pairings. I mean, he should be a top four D man for us. So um, step in should be able to contribute day one. We'll have him for a year, maybe two. I don't, I mean, unless something happens, I don't expect additional years out of him. Yeah, and I'm trying to think, what what year is he? You know, now you've got me second guessing because I'm looking on Elite Prospects at the moment. And he they have him listed as a 21-22 and that this is the season that he sits out as a transfer. 
Well, because technically that's the way he went through the NA, the NCAA was that this would be his missed year and then his junior year would be next year. So if he plays this year, if he got the exemption, which I hear they're granting almost every request, you know, they'll look at it, but almost every request gets um, gets granted for them to kind of start because if you expect a shortened season, we talked a little bit about that uh, because of COVID, but... I mean, if you expect a certain shortened season, um, it really doesn't hurt these guys to get something in, and it's better than them, you know, just sitting on a back end where they don't see any playing time. So, um, I, I guess we'll see. If he doesn't play this year, then next year is, is his junior year. Yeah, it's 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 always weird because normally when they transfer, they have to sit out a season before they get to play. Um, so I don't I don't know what the story is on that, but if UNO's got him listed on the roster. Then he's coming here, and I believe I saw him listed in the, and I can't find it at the moment. I I uh, believe he was listed um, in their story about incoming recruits this season. So, oh yeah, I think yeah. you're right. So we'll see him. Uh, where do you want to go from there? Well, I don't know, Jason. Where do you want to go from there? Well, we might as well. Stay on the back end. Talk about freshman on the freshman D coming in. Um, Krenzen. Talk about Krenzen. Yeah, let's talk about Nolan Krenzen. I think he's our best D prospect. You look at rookies, quote unquote rookies, freshmen as we call them in college, but um, I think he's got, from what I've seen at least, Skill set wise, probably the the better of the two freshman defensemen. Um, it's kind of interesting that we've got three new defensemen. Yeah, it is. It is. And Nolan Krenzen was a guy that I actually profiled in 2019 when he first committed. He was with the Sioux City Musketeers at that point in time, mm-hmm. and there was another another player that was recruited by the name of Matt Miller who we were watching that season and, and um, he looked like a good solid recruit. I, first and foremost, I mean, we just have to get kind of the, the kind of the fun and trivial out of the way. It is amazing that we've got two players on the roster named Nolan. I don't know what it was during those years that uh, made Nolan an attractive name for, <laughs> for parents, <laughs> but it is, I mean, that's, that's not that common of a name. And it is interesting that we have two players um, on there, but I, uh, you know, his coach with Sioux City, uh, when he played for them, uh, uh, said that he was a great skating defenseman, uh, that possesses, um, offense, uh, offensive skill. So I think he's a guy that looks like a, a good puck handler, has good presence on the ice. And, um, and, you know, when we recruited him, we were, we had fairly limited production. Um, on the offensive side of the ice with our D core. So I think he'll be a good solid player this season. We need that first pass defenseman. And I think he could fit well into that just based on what we've seen when he was here. You know, he, he was a trade from Sioux city to Omaha. So saw a little bit of him uh, here in Omaha, I think. So we'll, uh, we'll see, you know, a lot of these with, with freshmen, with rookies in NHL and stuff, you always say it, it's always interesting to see whether or not they'll pan out. And you'll have some guys you expect a lot out of, and, and just don't seem to don't seem to pan out well for us. So hopefully, hopefully yeah. And in forty, I mean, in, in forty four games last season, he had five goals and eighteen assists. So. And that's yeah. in the U- USHL, so that's a that's a good outing for a defenseman um, yeah. in the United States Hockey League. So, I think it'll be I think it'll be a good solid defenseman on the team um, coming in next season. And yeah, he's a guy that we've been watching uh, since 2019 when uh, when he first committed. So I'm excited. I'm always excited to get the USHL players. They're always good, solid, dependable players uh, in NCAA hockey. And uh, if you look at rosters. Um, in the various conference, it's always a who's who of players who played in the USHL. So uh, yeah. he'll be he he should be a good defenseman. 
Definitely. Jake Harrison is the other incoming freshman on the back end. Thoughts on Harrison? Did you do a profile on Harrison? I don't remember. No, I didn't do I a profile so. of Hira Harrison. And, I, and I'll and i be honest with you, I, if I recall correctly, I think he was kind of a surprise to me when I saw uh, the preseason article on the incoming freshman this season. They. It sounded like he was injured last season, so we don't really have a good read on recent performance with him. Yeah, and he's coming from the BCHL, so... You know, whenever you get those null BCHL guys, you know, I, I'd almost, part of me almost would rather have, you know, kids that make the jump from like Minnesota prep straight into NCAA because it's like, it seems to get covered more. So I know a little bit more about, you know, who they are. He's yeah, almost I just mean, a stat. I mean, Plug, again, like it's like, again, okay, you'll, 179, you'll... <laughs> five, nine, you kind of need a little bit more size, but don't let my Gabin let you hear that. I think he, did he play in the, the BCHL or the uh, Alberta <laughs> junior hockey league? I can't remember. Don't let him hear that. Same with Taylor Ward. He's going to be like, dude, <laughs> I'm not saying the not franchise. The I wish I knew seasons. about him. <laughs> like put up a video it's feed the, for me. That's the, the all BC, I need. The BCHL definitely is not at the level of the USHL. That is for sure. Or when you're looking at the top prep, you know, the, the top high school and prep teams in the country and you look at Minnesota high school hockey players, you know, you look at some of like our glory years when we got to the frozen four and we had a lot of the top Minnesota prep players. So I understand that. And when I look at his statistics, uh, looking at elite prospects, I, you know, he, he played in the BCHL for a number of years and I just, it's, it's interesting. His best year was 2017-18, where he had eight goals and 25 assists. But then 2018-19, he played one game in the BCHL. Then he played for the 49 games for the Fargo Force, and he had two goals and eight assists. So again, obviously he's a defenseman. So we're not, you know, we're not, we're not expecting ma- massive offensive production out of the player. But I just, again, I can't get much of a read on him. Um, so and. I, re- I still remember, I remember reading some stuff on some prospect kids and I laughed hysterically at this because there was, there was one that was projected by a number of scouting things to be, you know, high, low first round, high second round pick. And in the scouting notes, it said a product of the individuals around him. And I thought I wouldn't touch that kid with a 10 foot pole because I read that going, this kid's good because he plays with good players. Right. And sometimes... You know, sometimes these kids do mediocre in some of those leagues just because, you know, the talent's not there. They they step up to something like USHL or like NCAA and suddenly they're they're producing. And so, you know, I, I try not to to live too much in the stat sheet. Uh, I trust the coach. I mean, if he went out and looked at him and said, you you know, you'd be a good fit for UNO, my guess is, is that even if the stats aren't there, you know, he has a different role to play and, and he may just be one of those good hockey sense, you know, durable, uh, I guess, you know, I, w- I don't know if I'd say durable depending on, it sounds like he's had a little bit of injury problems, but I mean, he might be that stay at home, reliable kind of defenseman. I don't know. It'll be, a, it'll be, it'll be a look-see for me. I mean, We'll see if he plays. When he does play, we'll see, you know, how comfortable he feels out there. You know, he may be a guy that is here on a on a prep team for for a year and, and we'll be looking at next year for when we expect to see him play regular minutes. And we I mean we say this now and he'll end up being on the top power play Oh yeah. He'll power be, play unit in February. <laughs> he'll put I don't up, know. You know, we, Three we don't points know. He's, game he's an interesting guy, and he is—he is a guy that we I, that I did not follow. So um, there were a couple, and in addition to obviously the the transfer of Tyconic, which we had heard of, and obviously he's a junior. Um, you know, there there were just certain names uh, in the incoming class that I wasn't as familiar with. Obviously, we've been focused on some of the younger recruits that they've gotten, uh, right. who are fairly active on social media. So, you know, and obviously that's a few years away, so we don't know when they went or if those guys will come in. So this is a good guy to come in. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, like you said, is this going to be a, a situation where this is kind of a tryout on the team to see how he does, to see if you've got a diamond in the rough or 
or uh, who knows? Like I said, he could be captaining the power play unit by, you know. <laughs> by midseason, yeah. Yeah. So no no freshman at goal. We got the trio of sophomores still. Yep. You know, no really reason to kind of break them up. Um, Seville, and I'm, I'm happy with I fully Isa- expect to be the top. I'm happy with Isaiah Seville. Austin Roden. Was great I, when he was yep. relied on when he needed to be. Yep. So. Uh, forwards then. So we got a few to talk about. Uh, let's start with, hmm, who do we want to start with? All right. I want you to start with Bolson. Caden Bolson. Yep. I want you to start there. Yeah, no, he's one of the players I'm, uh, I'm excited about. And, and as you were talking about earlier, he's one of those, uh, Minnesota prep hockey players played for Shattuck St. Mary's, uh, <clears throat> has played most recently with Fargo in the USHL. And he's a guy who I was excited when UNO got him because he seemed like he was a, a big, strong defenseman. Um, he was a good looking prospect. Um, and if this means anything, when Bridget and I were walking around the concourse, I believe it was the game in the, uh, it was a game late in the season in the 2018, 19 season after he had committed to UNO, um, we saw him walking around in a suit and tie. And I got to tell you, he looked like a giant there, but I mean, I'm only 5'8", so who knows. But uh, he looked like a, a good, solid prospect. And I like those players, as we were talking about, that come out of the Minnesota prep ranks. I think he'll be a very dependable forward this season. I hate to put too much pressure on on freshmen coming in, but uh, he was a goal that – or he was a goal. He was a, a forward last season that had uh, 13 goals and 19 assists for Fargo. So – I'm excited to see right. him. I, I think he'll be good. I expect him to be that kind of reliable, you know, mid roster forward for us. And we need we need guys that can produce on the front end reliably. And I don't expect him to put up, you know, point per game kinds of numbers, but if he can chip in eight to twelve goals for us, I think, you know, we're getting our I say our money's worth, not like that matters in college hockey, but, you know, I think that that would be a, a good expectation for him. Uh, b- my personal experience with forwards that are really tall like this, 6'3", six 6'4", six um, sometimes they can they can be a little wonky on their skates. Uh, from what I've seen of him, I don't expect that. He looks like he's a pretty solid skater, so... You know, when you when you bump him to that next level, you know, hopefully he can make that transition well. But I I expect him a regular on the roster at least. He was originally a commitment to Don Lucia at Minnesota, right. so obviously the talents there. I mean, he he committed at a, a young young age. I think he was fifteen right. when he committed. So, you know, obviously, like we've talked about, things change uh, in the the course of a player's evolution. But I think, uh, I think, you know, one thing we've talked about the last two seasons in particular is how this team lacks depth. When you get, you know, when you get past kind of the first line on this roster, you know, some of the lines have had trouble. Some of the lower lines have had trouble performing. And I know that the coaches have played around with player combinations to try and remedy that. And I think when you look at some of these uh, forwards coming in this season, I think part of it's about building kind of a solid, you know, you know, two, three, and four lines with guys who can, you know, perform. And like you said, they don't, they don't necessarily have to be superstars. You just got to have guys who can go toe to toe with some of the best, uh, that the NCHC has to offer. You look at Duluth the past few years, uh, Mankato has been this way. Uh, I mean, North Dakota's always this way. The best Denver teams have always been teams where you look at the roster and you say, we can't, we can't go all in on defending the top line. You know, we could, we can put a checking line against them. Right. Uh, leave our top forwards and they'll be able to run around them. Right. You know, if you get into a situation where another team's fourth line can out check your top line, um, you're going to hurt. You're going to, you're going to struggle to win games and we need secondary scoring to take that pressure off to make teams think about how do you defend? How do you play UNO? Because you can't just go out there and say, shut down, you know, Taylor Ward and we can, you know, coast our way to victory. So hopefully he's the kind of guy that makes us a, a hard to play against team. 
a uh, tidbit of information. I don't know if, if it does not matter. This is irrelevant to the conversation. This is just stupid <laughs> trivia stuff that no one cares about. All four of our freshmen are right-handed shots. Okay. You care about that. Yeah. I no, really don't care about that. that. And <laughs> it's just one of those things I was like, I was going through it going, hey, wait a minute. Like, why are these all right-handed shots? Yeah, it does make I mean, it, there's plenty of left-handers, but it's, you know, already on the roster. I just, I just watched it going, huh, that's interesting. Oh, we, we need to, we, we need Sadly, we're not going to have any dinner with the Mavs this year. Cause this would be a great question for the quote. You know, do you like say, <laughs> oh, you know, that guy's a, that guy's a great recruit. He's a top prospect. But we've already got too many right-handers on our teams. We, <laughs> we need more left-handers. So forget it. Scratch him. I, mean, I know in the NHL, they always talk about like, oh, they need a, it's usually on defense. In all honesty, it, it's 90% of the time the question comes on defense and that's where we need it. Like you need a good right-handed defenseman to, to balance out, you know, left-handed. And we're in that way. We have a ton of left-handed defensemen and we're, we're lacking right-handed defensemen, uh, which is why Krenzen coming in, he's a right-handed, look at that freshman, right-handed, uh, <laughs> Coming in, I think, you know, I think that helps a little bit, but I don't, I don't, I would not expect that Gabnitz is going to say, oh yeah, well, yeah, we're going to our roster and went, oh man, too many lefties, let's cross him off the list and we'll take this mid-level talent because well, we just it, need a right it guy. It definitely can affect certain matchups with, uh, with the yeah. opposing team. And it, it can also affect when, you know, when you're on the power play and you're trying to move the puck around. I say it, it matters on the power play. It matters in the face-off dot. That's the one thing yep. is I know from playing my years of playing, there are a number of times that we've put guys in. You know, I've subbed out with guys on my line just because it's in a situation where a right-handed draw is more productive than my left-handed draw. And so there's situations where it matters, but for the most part, it's just kind of this stupid trivia thing. But yeah. So let's move on to, uh, I want to move on to Jimmy Glenn because I want to talk to the last two as a pair because they're ones that we've talked about on the podcast before. So it's only right that we kind of um leave them there as well uh jimmy glenn what do you know about glenn i know absolutely nothing about glenn i'm like who the hell is oh, this thank guy? god i was like wait a minute i gotta read up this guy <laughs> <laughs> i was he was one of He's the surprise from illinois ones. like and, and just just to for people out there who do not read the map puck website each year i you know last season i only think i did one but each year i usually do a couple of like recruiting roundups where I look at all of our prospects that are listed out there on the recruiting sites and kind of look at where they are in the season when I write that particular blog post. And I don't recall, I mean, I got to be honest with you. I don't recall seeing him at all. So, <laughs> so we're, okay. I'm flying blind here on this one, but he did play for the Jamestown rebels, which was uh, a North American hockey league team that uh, UNO defenseman, Alex Waugh played for. And I believe former Mav Billy Puglisi, who uh, is Billy an assistant with the Lincoln Stars currently. I know in the past he had coached scout. your daughter's youth I think hockey he's team. Scout. Yeah, I think he's. But he's scout a, he's a scout him. with Jamestown, and I I can't remember is he scout with Lincoln or is he an assistant with Lincoln? I can't. I, I I'm not hundred percent confident, but I believe he scouts for Lincoln. Okay. So this might be another uh, this might be another uh, referral from Mr. Yeah. Puglisi. And I wouldn't if that is the case, I uh, I think that that's a good thing. If if he comes into my office and says, "Hey, you need to take a look at this kid." If I'm Gabs, I'm paying attention. So you know, he had a really good 18-19 season. You know, he kind of fell off with the Saints at the USHL level. So I have some questions about him making progressions up, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm not worried about the seven goals, 11 assists, uh, with Dubuque. I actually think that's all right. But yeah, I mean, is this, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm totally thrown off. Is this a player? Did he go by something other than Jimmy? Did he go by, did he go by like James Glenn or Jim Glenn or something? I don't know. I mean, we're really meandering on this player. I, I don't know anything about Jimmy Glenn right now. And again, like I said, he'll probably be on the top power play unit by the end of the season. And to clarify on Billy Puglisi, he is the director of scouting for the Lincoln Stars right now. So 
There I don't. Go. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know if he's uh, involved with Jamestown at this point or not. But uh, I think he's a player who could potentially. I, I you know. Again, it, it goes back to my my comment when we were talking about Caden Bolson about building depth. And building, you know, minimally three solid lines on this team, three lines that can produce. And you and know the last couple of seasons, in particular two seasons ago, where they really struggled was when you got past that top line. The, you know, two, three, and four lines could just not produce for this team. And that just, that killed us in NCHC play. We've yeah. got to have the horses to be able to go the distance. I almost forgot about one. Um, Jack Randall's a sophomore. Tra- he's actually a sophomore transfer because he played for Michigan in 1819 before playing for the Lancers last year. Oh yeah, we definitely need to talk about. Yeah, we definitely need to talk about Jack Randall. Uh, Chicago prospect. He went up through the Chicago mission system, which. I've seen some some Chicago Mission games uh, when they've come out to Colorado play teams. I've seen them um, in a couple of situations. It's an interesting group. I think their their progression trees, you know, produce some pretty good talent and stuff. And then, you know, Jack here has been who was Lancers, Lancers, and then spent some time with the U eighteen team, and then uh, University of Michigan before coming back to the Lancers. He's produced well at the USHL level, and but I think he struggled. I don't know why. I think he struggled a little bit at Michigan. I'm hoping that whatever that was. Sometimes you see kids that, you know, they struggle their first year just because there's so much of a change from life as a, you know, as a high school student or an adult that's, you know, working and playing at a USHL team or something to then having to be a student athlete and, and, Maybe some of that University of Michigan stuff was his, uh, you know, struggles transitioning to that. Um, hopefully he can get to numbers. Uh, if he can get to numbers like he put up with the Lancers, uh, we're, we're going to do well. I'm really encouraged by the fact that he wore a letter for two of his three seasons with the Lancers. I think that means this is the kind of guy that Gabnet's talked about as a leader, a guy who knows how to get things done, put in the work ethic, uh, you know, spend the time that he needs to spend and be committed to his craft. So, well, and it's one of those situations. Yeah, I don't know why he didn't, uh, why he didn't uh, take root at Michigan. Um, I, you know, obviously when you know Red Berenson retired and Mel Pearson came back uh, to take the reins as head coach at Michigan, it's it's possible that he just didn't mesh with what they were doing. You know what I'm saying? Right. Having been re- recruited under a previous regime, I'm always, I'm always, uh, you always kind of wonder about that. Um, no, he's, he's had, he had success in juniors for sure. Um, and his time with the Lancers, he definitely produced. And so, and this isn't the Lancers of the late 1990s under Mike Hastings that were just a juggernaut either. So, uh, he'll be a good solid player for you. And you know, like, like we were talking about earlier with Tyconic, um, or Tyconic, or again, however, you know, Primo, Primu, whatever, <laughs> whatever we call them on this podcast. I like those guys from top <laughs> programs who come through the transfer portal. Like we were talking um, about Kevin Conley earlier and um, some of these other guys uh, that we've gotten as transfers the last three seasons. It's a, it's a good way to get veteran leadership, veteran players uh, who hopefully can come in when they get their kind of their second chance in college hockey can make a difference. So no, I think I think he'll be a I think I think he'll be a good player and he could be a an impact player out of the gate. I really think he could. You know, he's a he's a veteran with a lot of experience and so I'm I'm always excited. I'm always excited to have former Lancers on the team too. So no, I think he'll be a and I'm glad you caught that cuz uh I did not want to overlook him in this podcast. Yeah, it would have been a shame to overlook him. So yeah. should we get to the pair as we call them since we saw them play in Lincoln for a couple seasons. Uh, Brock Bremer and Matt Miller. Yeah, and you guys, I got to see Brock Bremer play in person because he was with um, the Muskegon Lumberjacks in that game. The game that we saw, I think, was it December of 2018 that we saw that game? 
Yeah, would have been 18. They came and played the Omaha Lancers. And, um, yeah, Brock Bremer, uh, and I believe Brock Bremer was playing on a line with Nolan Sullivan. I could be wrong on that. It's, it's been a couple of years now. But he played with Muskegon, and he was a really exciting player to watch. I think of the two, uh, Miller is the one that I really liked when we watched him in Lincoln. When Lincoln came to down, I think that he's got... He's got that pedigree that I kind of expect. He's got that work ethic that I think Coach has talked about. And he's been productive. Right. Pretty much all the way along the way, you know. He's, uh, I think he's struggled a little bit making some transitions. Everyone kind of does. Um, but he's clearly been relied upon in heavy situations. Uh, he wore a letter with Sioux City his second season. He wore a letter when he went to Lincoln. Um, he's the kind of kid that I could see, you know, obviously not first year. I don't know very many freshmen come in and wear a letter first year, but I could certainly see him wearing a letter in future years. Oh, absolutely right. He um, he was a real leader on that Sioux City team when he played for them, and he was originally a uh, he was originally a Michigan State recruit. Um, mm-hmm. So obviously, he's attracted the attention of some of the top um, you know the top college hockey teams in the nation, and he's a guy that that I was uh, I was very excited about. And a little known piece of trivia here because I did a write up I did a write up on Matt Miller back in twenty nineteen. I was really prolific in the 2018-19 season. Last season it just fell off and then the season ended. But I need to do that again because it's actually really helpful when we're having the discussion. But he's a former teammate of Nate Konepke. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that. Huh. So Did not? Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. He so had he'll, a, he had a, he'll have a friend right away to kind of well, guide he him. Well, he had a brief stint with the National... Um, national development program. And so I'm always, I'm always excited to get those guys who come out of that because those tend to be top tier players um, who tend to have a good head on their shoulders. And like you said, I think that this is a player who can become a leader. You know, we talked about that with Nolan Sullivan prior to last season. And I think, I think Matt Miller's one of those guys. So. Yeah, I think in, in past pot in past podcasts, struggled a little bit with that one. Uh, we've talked about some of the current guys, and and I still see, you know, Miller, um, Sullivan, um, Proctor is one I can see be kind of those kind of reliable future, you know, the guys we hear their name, you know, one of them at least every night or something. Bremer, I think, could could fit into that. Yeah, and Bremer, Bremer was a small, kind of a small sp- Speedy player, and he's a guy that we've been waiting on a long time to come in. Um, I had hoped that maybe he would come in last season, but ultimately uh, he played uh, junior hockey one more season. But yeah, they're 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 both going to be. I just look at those guys as both being kind of these solid, you know, logged a lot of playing time uh, in the junior ranks, and those guys usually, like I said, they hit the ground running when they come into college, and those are the kind of players that we need. And and as we're talking about again, the evolution and building depth. You know, I'm seeing a lot of guys on the roster going into this season who who can uh, perform, you know. Right. Well, and as we've said, it's consistency at this point in time. We need these kids to be a reliable pieces of the puzzle for us. And that's, you know, that we'll see in coming seasons. Yeah, I mean, I'm not looking for a guy who's going to score, you know, 25 goals this season. It, it, you know, it, it may very well be sport, scoring by committee more and more as the seasons progress. Um, you know, I think that Coach Gabinet would like to have more balance on the roster. And so I think, uh, like you said, both Miller and Bremer are two, two solid guys. And, yeah. I, and I would add Caden Bolson to that list as well. And yeah. then there's Jimmy Glenn, who we we don't know anything about. We have, we have no idea. We might as well just say, might as well just say he is too. It makes it easy. Yeah, he'll be he'll be great as well. Yeah, absolutely. What else do we have to talk about, John? Well, I think the I think the big elephant this season is whether we're actually going to get to go watch UNO hockey games. Ooh, 
This is this one. I'm not sure, Jason. I mean, I, I I sensed earlier before we were talking. I'm not sure that Jason wants to talk about this or not. And I don't know if it's, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's just kind of this general malaise that I've seen on Twitter among college hockey aficionados like ourselves. There just seems to be just like a, a melancholy, a depression where fans are just like this favorite thing that we enjoy doing for five, six months every fall and winter. We're going to have to watch a stream of the game online. Are we going to get to go to UNO hockey games? I've heard rumors that have said that they're not going to have fans at UNO hockey games this season. I know that there have been some teams like, uh, for example, uh, UMass announced that they're not going to have fans at their hockey games uh, this season. They, uh, They play in Hockey East. So I don't know what's going to happen. It's hard to know when you're part of a university system that includes the University of Nebraska Medical Center and you share a chancellor with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and UNMC is one of the top infectious disease you know, hospitals in the nation. We've treated Ebola patients at the hospital. <laughs> you ask yourself whether they're going to make a cavalier decision with something like this. But I also look at it from the standpoint of part of that concern from a fan base about what's going on, part of our reason for discussing this about whether or not we're actually going to be able to go to a game is, is that unknown factor. And I think a lot of that comes from the powers that be at the university saying, let's not pigeonhole ourselves. Let's, kind of, let's not put ourselves in a position like bed taking football where we say, nope, we're not doing football. It's not happening too risky. And then, well, you know, now we're going to do it because <laughs> everyone because, else is doing it or something. You know, and I really think that when the Big Ten and the Pac-12 made that decision about Division One football this year, um, or their, their Division One football teams this year, I think they really thought that the SEC, ACC, and Big 12 would fall, and other conferences would fall in the line, and that that did not happen. So I think then they were kind of left in a situation where, where it was like, well, these other teams are playing, the NFL is playing. I guess there's no reason we can't play either. And so the Big Ten starts... But then you look at the risk, right? You then look yeah. at those teams like NFLs had to cancel games, postpone games, technically. Because of players um, having Because COVID. of outbreaks, yeah. right? And even the NBA tried the bubble system, and they had confirmed cases come out. So... I mean, the only the only sports, as far as I am aware, from what I have read and heard, the only professional sports um, league that's been able to make it work has been the NHL. And it took literally, essentially, quarantining, quarantining the players is, is really what they had to almost do. Almost the entire league to two cities. Like, yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, I think it, it's a testament to the the mental fortitude that there is in hockey, because I don't believe personally, personal opinion, chastise me if you want. I don't believe that any other sport could have done what the NHL did. I don't believe that other sports players are committed and, and fans are committed to the product that they put on the ice as NHL is where they said, you know what? You're going to leave your family for a couple months and you're going to try to win the Stanley cup. And if you don't want to do that, you can opt out and stay home, and that's fine. Um, but if you want to win a Stanley Cup, this is the way it's going to happen. And the majority of players said, you know, we'll give up a couple months with our family to make a run at this, to try to, you know, try to get it to go. And to so, finish the season and get the NHL playoffs in. And we watched those games, and right. it was it was, it was was great to be able to watch hockey. It was really bizarre not to have any fans. I don't know if you were the one who sent it to me. Somebody sent me one of those, one of the, one of the games where it said tonight's attendance. And it said zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. It was not the same watching without fans. And, and it, this is a, this is a hard topic for me because as you know, I have a 486 or 488, whatever the hell it is, attendance streak that goes back to the very first home attendance streak that goes back to the very first UNO hockey game back in October of 1997. And so it's really hard to imagine a season where I'm not going to hockey because quite honestly, as silly as this might sound, the only thing that really makes winter in Nebraska bearable 
is going and watching the UNO hockey team play. I've got to be honest with you. And it just it makes me sad inside to think that that might not happen. It also makes me feel, you know, grumpy and cynical and everything. Because you know as well as I do that they'll say, you know, we're not allowing any fans other than, you know, player parents at games. And I'm going to pull up my Twitter during some game if, if, if fans aren't allowed or, you know, some other social media outlet. And I'm going to see some goofball fan who was allowed to go to the game for some reason that I'm, I may know or may not know. And it's, it's probably going to irritate me. And it's just, it's hard to know what to do. You know, it seems like every week something different happens. You know, we just think that we're kind of getting back on track and, and things are going to be okay. And then all of a sudden something happens, whether it's the aforementioned uh, NFL games that you mentioned where they have to postpone a game because a player tested positive for COVID right. or, or something else. And again, I don't know, I don't know what to do, you know? I think you can, to a certain degree, you can look at what professional sports and other teams are looking and saying, you know, make plans and set your expectations accordingly. And with that, I would say, you know, NHL is, they're operating on the belief that they will have fans in the arena when the season starts, uh, which they announced will be after January 1st. What I'm hearing is January 2nd will be the first games. And that they will shorten the season to try to get themselves in a position where they can start the 2021-22 season on time. And it will be their plan right now is that fans will be in attendance and they will be able to have at least season ticket holders there. And at least from what I've been told from with my season tickets in the Avs is that essentially put in your deposit because if it becomes a situation where they're limited in numbers, they're going to start taking names in order of when did you put your deposit down? And so I wouldn't be surprised if UNO does something similar and says, and so set, you know, I'm not saying this is disclaimer. I'm not saying this is the way it's happening. Do not take this to the university and say, Jason on math puck said, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying set your expectations of the only people they'll allow fans in, but it's going to be no concession sales. Uh, it's going to be season ticket holders only. And if it has to be less than season ticket holders, which with our arena and our season ticket sales, I don't expect will be the case. But if it does, um, those who have had season tickets the longest are first in line to get tickets this year. And the thing is, if you can't, if you can't make the game, sell your ticket. Cause going to be at a premium but <laughs> yeah it's it's definitely I, it's definitely an interesting one i obviously there's still you know we're still making payments on our tickets i think this coming week is the last uh the last payment will go through for those who did the multi-month payment plan i know that they they sent out an email um a few weeks ago saying that if you had already paid a deposit but you hadn't paid the remainder of your season ticket balance holder balance if you uh if you paid them by uh, i believe it was november 15th you could still get season tickets for this season. Um, now, again, I don't know if that's a, you know, we're kind of hedging our bets, you know, hoping we are able to have fans. But if we're not able to have fans, at least, you know, we're going to have revenue coming in. And if, uh, you know, we can't have fans this season, we'll just allow fans to defer till next season or they can get a refund. I do think if they do have to do a situation like that, I think they should make getting a refund for fans easy. It's kind of like, you know, Bridget and I with the neighborhood pool that we run. There were some members who wanted a refund who, because of COVID, didn't want to come this season. There were some who decided to defer their membership till next season. I think you give people options in that situation. I it, the, the crux of the situation is I don't know how many season ticket holders we have. You know, if we have 4,000 season tickets that are sold, you know, you could probably, you know, have a, a situation where you, you had 50% capacity because you could accommodate your your uh, loyal paying customers. Um, you know, news did come out within the last uh, week or two that, you know, the Omaha Lancers, which is our USHL club, that they're, they've announced that at Ralston Arena, which is, you know, just down the road from Baxter Arena, that they're going to have 75% capacity, which I think is fascinating. Um, 
they're outside of the Omaha city limits, so there's no mask mandate for them. And so they're saying no mask, which I, I also think, <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a bold plan. I'll be interested to see when their season starts November 13th, if they stick with it, uh, Lincoln stars, which are down the road in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, they're going to have 50% capacity. Their season ticket holders are going to be socially distanced. They have a mask mandate. So it'll be interesting to see if those teams have to adjust early on. And depending on when UNO season starts, it might, it might give them an opportunity to look at, at two hockey entities, uh, here in the States and, uh, see how things go with them. It's, it'll be interesting to know what they'll, what they're going to do exactly about concessions, everything else. I know they're going to have like particular entrances in and entrances out for, for different fans. So um, it, it'll just be fascinating to see. I just, I, I'm torn because I, you know, I, you know, safety is important to us and Bridget and I were wearing masks before it was a requirement to wear a mask. And I know you guys were too, but, but I, I really want to go watch hockey this season. It's, it's it's the hard. It's, I, I know it sounds to, silly, but you know. Right. The other thing that you have to factor into the situation is, is that these teams, NCAA hockey, USHL hockey, with the Omaha Lancers, Lincoln Stars type of thing, uh, they're a different beast, and they don't have TV revenue. Right. You know the NCAA, the NCHC package, you know, is is a good opportunity for fans of the nchc but from a season ticket holder standpoint as i've already paid my money and i want to see my team it's not the same watching on tv and it really questions like why would i spend more money to see what i thought i was paying for and so you really question like what is the service that you're giving to your season ticket holders how are you making sure that they stay season ticket holders in the future through all of this uncertainty? Uh, that's my one big knock to the university this summer has been like, I don't feel like they've really done very much or enough outreach to season ticket holders to say, we care about you. We appreciate your support of the university. This is what we're operating off of. This could change tomorrow. So don't hold us to any of this but this is what we're trying to work towards. At least tell me that your expectation is this, because I'm aware that it can change. I'm aware that my tickets may not be valid and things like that, but you, I feel comfortable then you taking care of me, like my NHL stuff, you know? I put down the deposit because I feel confident based on the relationship that I've established with having season tickets for years and going to games for years, that if something changes, that they will treat me well and take care of me. And early on, I would have said the same thing about UNO. As time has progressed, I feel less confident in that statement. And the fact that I feel left conf less confident in that statement worries me a little bit. Yeah, ex absolutely. I mean, I, we always talk about transparency with UNO because they, they're not, they're not always the best at marketing, you know, and I, I think they've, they've, they've tried in recent seasons. They're trying to make improvements. I think the hard thing is, you know, I, I just give you a, an example in, in, in recent communications with fans, when they talk about, for example, if fans can't go to games, you know, if you want a refund, I mean, their comment about it is, you know, our system doesn't handle refunds, so you'll have to notify us in writing. And it, it sounds like something, and it, this may not have been the intention, but it sounds like something that like the DMV would send out, like, you know, you're going in writing, you're going to have to, you know, get form 2320 and you're going to have to fill it out and have it notarized by a notary republic, <laughs> notary public. And uh, then you're going to have to submit it before this date in order to get your refund. They should just say, if you want a refund, you can get a refund. Um, it won't be a problem, uh, you know, uh, but we want you back as a season ticket holder. So uh, you can get a credit on next season. This assumes a scenario where they don't have fans. Um, in right. The or if you give them it, like it's the classic example, you know, tax policy and not to get political. But this concept of like, is it better to. Is it better to make the process easy and give them an incentive not to do take the action that you want them to take? Or is it better to make the process hard and reward them for not taking the action that you've made difficult to take. 
right? Because yeah, I, I, like, and that's the thing for me personally. Like, I just feel like it's it's better if they make it easy to say, "I want my money back," but say if you defer to next season and use this as your 2021 22 season tickets, you're all paid up and you don't have to worry about it. And we'll throw in something. Something. So that at least I feel like, okay, I feel better about you holding on to my money for a year because I know I'm going to get it back next season. Yeah, because basically the fans, and, and I don't mean for this to sound cynical, but I mean, basically, the if in that scenario, if fans aren't allowed to come to games, basically the UNO hockey fan base is, you know, is giving the program a no interest loan for 12 months. And so. Like you said, if you could give some sort of an incentive, and I don't know what that is. Is it a discount? If you can find a way with the conference to give a discount on an NCHC TV membership for the year, or if it's a, you know, you get a t-shirt or or some sort of special season ticket holder reception before the following season, whatever the case may be. Maybe it's, maybe it's having a picnic with, with more than just the Blue Line Club board members. Maybe it's having a a season ticket holder picnic somewhere before the 2021-22 season. You've got to do something because ultimately there will be people that are not like us that are, that are going to, you know, that are going to, even if there's a, the season doesn't allow for fans to attend this year, we're still going to go back the following season. We're still going to be there, but there are some fans that if they, if they don't go this year and they find, you know, that, you know, when it's snowing and there's a layer of ice on the streets, it's, you know, it's nice to just sit at home and uh, and do something else on a Friday or Saturday night. They may not renew. So so again, you, you in both instances, you know, you've got you've got to make it easy to get a refund. But as you say, if uh, if people are, are making that commitment early and, and there is no hockey for them to go watch in person this year or or there's hockey, but they can't go watch it in person this year that you will take care of them in some way, shape, or form. And it's that fan service aspect that we've talked about in previous podcasts. And hopefully they're making plans for no fans. You know, the NHL had, I thought, great plans. You know, the teams did some good stuff with connecting with their fan base through social media that they then used as, I wanted to say propaganda, um, material (laughs) in the rinks. To create at least some sort of atmosphere. But, you know, they produced good video. It was good hockey to watch. And I don't feel like the production level on NCHC TV is remotely close. And I, I hope that they're doing more to say, we need to plan on the fact that there is no fans in the stands and we're playing into an empty arena and our diehard fans like John and Jason and the rest of the Mavpuck community that will watch no matter what, whether we're at the game or not, we need to produce something so that there's an incentive to purchase that that package, whether that's uh, NCHC package or a UNO TV type of thing, or you know, NBC had the rights to everything with the NHL, so it was on you know every NBC channel or something like that. Like, do you partner with a local station and say, look? We're going to, you know, we're going to drive viewership for UNO games. We want UNO games on your network, whatever that may be. I want to see a video product. I know I'm not going to get NHL level, but I want to see a video pro- product that is miles better than what I've seen before. Right. And maybe that maybe that would be on Nebraska Educational Television, which has has done a fine job broadcasting some of the games. Maybe it's on a KXVO in here. Or whatever the case may be. You're right. The NHL had good production value, even though there weren't any fans. They had the, the cool graphics over the empty seats. You know, they, they tried. They tried to make it a, an interesting atmosphere. And I, I, I know you're, you're feeling probably as similar to my feeling, where it's just going to be a bunch of empty arenas with teams playing <laughs> hockey this season. It'd be cool to do like, like we've seen them do in, in football, where they, um, if they don't have fans, where you can, you can pay cardboard you know, cutouts, 50 bucks and get a cutout of yourself. I mean, Look, again, a 480 whatever game attendance streak. If if I can't be there, you know, let, let me buy a, a cardboard picture of myself to have sitting in this some I need to be represented there some way, one way shape or form, Jason. Um because like and I we said, really want to support the team, right? It's yeah. that, those kinds of things, at least when I did the NHL stuff, like it was really about the team appreciates knowing that 
even though they can't hear us in the stands at home, we're cheering for them and we're pulling for them and we're wanting them to do well. And I mean, the things that they've done, I've, I've seen NHL members that have posted in not just Avalanche, like in other teams that their fans have posted messages and they've shown those messages and then video, you know, they've, they've videotaped uh, a player on the team watching the message from fans about, you know, we're sorry you lost, we're pulling for you, we'll get them next season, good job, right? Right. Like, I really feel like, especially with kids at this age, like, I think it's important for them to hear from us as fans and know that it sucks, we know it sucks, we know it's not the experience you wanted from college, but we still support you, we still appreciate we still want to see you succeed. And as fans, if it means sitting in front of my TV and cheering for you, know that I'm sitting in front of my TV cheering for you. Right. But we'd much rather be there at those games. We would much rather because be there. Because I got to tell you, when I look at when I look at my adult life, a, a lot of my best memories have come at, at UNO hockey games. And I know we get silly online and we bicker back and forth as fans and we look ridiculous and we take this thing way too seriously. But that's part of what makes life fun. It's part of what makes doing this podcast fun, and it's just, it's a really special part of my life, and I know hockey's a special part of your life, and I hope, I hope we will be able to attend to season ticket holders this season, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be praying to the hockey gods that that happens, and, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll get to enjoy some hockey games with you guys uh, uh, this season, socially distanced, of course, <laughs> with our masks but, on. But Mav Puckcast will be here. We will be doing episodes as much as we can, considering till they start playing at least lack of content. Uh, join us next week. You'll want to hear about our expectations for the season, and we'll talk more about some of the returning players. Uh, so that'll be a, a good second part to this. Absolutely. Now that we've talked about the prospects. And if you're not um, if you're not following along, be sure to follow Map Puck on Twitter, Map Puck on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Follow MavPuck.com, where we have all of our back catalog of podcasts, as well as some other fun things, blog posts, a message board, etc. And until next time, go Mavs. Go Mavs.